Hey everybody, welcome inside the sit down. Today we have Matt Mitrione set to headline Bellator 215 coming up this Friday. His bout with Sergei Karatanov going to headline that. Then a double header from Bellator as well coming up 16 on Saturday, both of them at the Mohegan Sun Casino. Matt, thanks for the time today. How you thanks, doing, brother? I appreciate it, man. Good. I barely snuck by security, so they may come. All right, well, we'll try and get this done quickly so we yeah. can get you in and out real stealthy. Sounds good. I All appreciate right. it. All right, good. So, uh, obviously, you've been in this fight game a while, but I'm, I'm just curious, just what drew you to you were playing football first mm. and then going into MMA? Seemed to like the contact sports. What, what really drew you to that? Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, this is a career I never wanted. Uh, I, uh, when I got, when, more appropriately, when the NFL got done with me, mm -hmm. um, I started a sports nutrition company. And uh, that product we f designed and manufactured um, as post-workout formula. And that product ended up in the hands of a Major League Baseball player named Jason Worth. Right. And uh, Worth uh, liked it, kind of publicized it a little bit, and then asked me, hey, look, do me a favor and jump on an amateur MMA show in our hometown of Springfield, Illinois. Mm -hmm. It's like, jump on that show, and then um, we'll call it square. I don't, you don't have to pay me for anything, and you'll help me out. Right. I said, well, I can't really say no, so sure, <laughs> might as well do yeah, that. Yeah, uh, as well. I never trained a day of fighting or wrestling in my life, and I uh, actually got injured uh, in training for that and missed his fight. But then I was friends with the guy I was training with at the time, so I kept training, and then I found out that the uh, Ultimate Fighter was doing a heavyweight show. Mm -hmm. So I get a phone call and said, hey, look, we hear you're obnoxious. You've never fought before, <laughs> uh, but that you could, either you could be a villain on a TV show. Sure. Are you interested in that? And so when I brought it back home to my wife, um, I thought about it, and, and like you know, worst comes to worst, we bring the product on the show, and we get product placement, right. so that way it's free advertising we can never afford to do anyways. Like, so what the hell, might as well do it, even if I get beaten up, and then 10 years later, I have no more supplement company, and I fight people for a living. All right, well, I mean, it seems to work, have worked out for you, to say the least, yeah. but you talk about football being done with you. Uh -huh. Now, I'm, I'm just curious, going through your football career, what, what was the point where you really realized, was it the seven surgeries? Just when was it that you kind of realized, like, okay, I, I just, I can't continue? Yeah, the, the surgeries were pretty significant. Uh, you know, my, I knew from, I knew from the, from probably like the third, the, the infection and everything else that was kind of going on, uh, that it was going to be a, a long crawl back. I was told I could never wear flip flops again. I was told I'd, I'd never be able to walk normally again. I could, uh, there was a lot of limits to my life. Um, and from that, told you security was coming. You thought I was playing. <laughs> they're, 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 they're right here. They're yeah. down the door for you. <laughs> they're coming in, brother. Um, and then I realized that, that my career w was limited. The writing was on the wall. Um, so I had to do something else. And uh, I'm not afraid of taking a risk. So I think that was kind of the, the beginning of the end. Plus, like, I was... I didn't handle the stress of playing football well. Like okay. being in the NFL, I was a bubble guy, right? Right. Like, so if you're number one through number 46, you're pretty secure on the roster. Right. Uh, I was number 53, and there's 53 right. so, men and, on the active you're roster. Always, you're always wondering, am yeah. I going to get cut this week? Yeah. Am I going to get Tuesday, sent to Tuesday, the, pra brother, the practice I'm like, squad? Please let me be right. here, you know? <laughs> right. um, and so I, I, I drank a lot, and I kind of partied more than I should have. I uh, carried on some habits from high school, I mean from college. And... Um, and, and I think that that was probably the, it was, I wasn't mature enough for that role. Okay. Uh, and I think that that's, it was just kind of showed itself in a different way. Um, and then from that, when I started the company and this happened, I kind of realized that this, this career, uh, I realized that this career was kind of like a, a gifting. And uh, if I take it seriously, it could last me a while. And that's what I've done with it. That's why I try to take my job as seriously as possible. Yeah, so it seems like it's almost become really a, a second chance for you to, to build that career. And, and in the fight game, obviously, it's a tough one, but you have the personality to both sell the fights and obviously the skills within the octagon to make things work. So what was it when you realized from that ultimate fighter call, like, okay, yeah, mm -hmm. I, can, I can make something of this going forward? Um, well, I was happy I got to fight Marcus Jones. That's who I've beaten the finale. Uh, I knocked him out in a second. And then I think, I think it was my next fight was Kimbo. Uh, and then with all the, the lead up and all the madness there was with Kimbo, and then the fight, I realized, because like, my life changed immediately. As soon as, I yeah. fought, as soon as I beat Kimbo, everything was different. Everything was, uh, and it was, it was, it was wild. I remember I got paid twenty six thousand um, dollars, eight and eight, and then a ten thousand dollar bonus. And uh, I remember thinking like, well, that's, that's such a small amount of money for all the work I did. 
Um, but I called my wife and I was like, hey, we made this. And we were like, you know, thank God you finally made some, some money out of mm -hmm. all the time that we've invested here. Right. And then a week later, I was all over the world. They flew me to London. They, I mean, they were, I was everywhere doing things again. Uh, and it was, I was like, you know what, this is going to become my lifestyle unless I start sucking. Um, and uh, the lifestyle kind of led to my divorce. I wasn't home enough. I, I didn't. I was kind of absent at home because I was thinking more about the career. Uh, and I had kids, and it wasn't really a, a fair situation there. But as far as um, financial security and freedom of our lives, uh, that really set the table for it. And my ex and I get along great now. We have mm -hmm. uh, we live in the same town. Everything goes well. Kids go back and forth all the time. Uh, things are great. Um, but it was just something that. I didn't nurture what I should have nurtured, or, or didn't nurture a marriage, I nurtured a career. And I think that was a, that's kind of the, the trade-off of having a celebrity lifestyle or an right. active traveling lifestyle. And, and that's an interesting point because it's one that I think a lot of athletes and a lot of celebrities really struggle with mm -hmm. in, in that respect, is trying to find that balance between chasing that career that is going to provide for your family and also having the time for the family. So just when, what was the point for you where you really found that balance, or have you found it yet? Um, well, I, I do believe I found it, but I mean, let's not take that away. I think that's every every person that's that that's on the paper chase. Everybody that has a hustle mm -hmm. struggles with that, right? Like, do you work two jobs, or do you go home and help help this at home, right? Do you do you help your kids with homework, or do you go out and, and, and run this instead, right? There's always that kind of a hustle that's that's really difficult to to balance. Um, I think, fortunately, uh, my my pay has increased, right? Um, so I've been to a situation where. I can have more freedom and I'm home now. So I'm, I'm a stay-at-home dad that goes and fights people for money when I do. Um, I mean, it's funny, like I, the, my middle son, Jonah, uh, I remember one day we were driving in the car and he's like, Dad, what's up, dude? He's like, why do dads fight for money? And I was like, oh, well, it's not every dad, brother. Right. It's like a, a little bit different than what we right. are here, you know? Right. Um, but it, it's just the lifestyle they've always known. So they never knew me playing football, but they know the, this career I have here. Um, and it's, I'm fortunate where I can go read to my sons at school, uh, my, my, all my kids. Uh, I'm involved. I, I, I drop, drop things off. I do chores. I do things at school. And I, like, hell, on Friday I fight. On Saturday I fly home first thing, smoke, and land at 1.30, have a father-daughter dance that starts at 5 o'clock. Right. Um, and that's just, that's the way it goes. Like, but, uh, but I'm fortunate enough to be able to be in that situation where I can do all that and make it work. Um, but for everybody else, I, I, that's, a, that's a tough hustle, man. That's the, the struggle. Is the extra paycheck worth losing the family time? Right. And that's the balance. And you mentioned Friday, of course, coming up with that big bout, Bellator 215 mm -hmm. against Sergey Karatanov. And uh, in reading some of what you've said coming up to this fight, you really respect your opponent and what he's done over the course of his career. So just give me a little bit of insight into how you view him going into this <coughs> fight. Um, Karatanov is... Uh, He's a legend, man. I mean, he's he's very he's really on par with Fedor esque. Fedor didn't lose for ten years. Karatanov lost four times in ten years. I mean, right. really, that that's kind of the same thing. Yep. Uh, and the people he lost, he lost in like different sports. He like he did MMA, he did kickboxing, um, he's done everything across the board, and he's just tough. He's durable. He's he's powerful. He's a medaled boxer in Russia. You know, I mean, he's just he's so good at what he does. Uh, he doesn't make mistakes. Um, and he's big. He's 6'5", 6'5 six, five, six, five 280. That's a big dude with a lot of power. And, and, and he did to Roy Nelson, who he fought last time, mm -hmm. uh, in one round what I couldn't do to Roy in three. He knocked Roy out, slept him bad, dropped him on his face kind of bad. Right. And uh, I couldn't do that to Roy in three rounds. So I, I know that if you stand there and get beat up by him, that's uh, a bow open you don't want to take. Uh, but luckily that's not really the way I fight. But in that fight with, against Roy, um, Roy was winning that fight for a good two and a half, three minutes of the four and a half minute fight. And uh, Kertanov dropped one strong jab on him, changed Roy up, and Roy stood there and got beat up. Uh, so hopefully that doesn't happen to me. And if it does, uh, I better get on my bike and start moving my butt around. There, right, right. You know? and, and for you, you, you understand that the fight game is a bit of a double-edged sword in that respect. We were talking about this a little off camera before mm -hmm. we came on and the fact that Yes, you're getting a payday, but at yeah. the same time, you're going to be taking these hits. And, and from a guy like Karatanov, just what's it like to go up against this guy that is a legend in the game, but also is a big bruising fighter? Yeah, um, you know, that's, it, it's funny because uh, I, I'm, I'm arrogant enough, which I should be, uh, to believe that I'm, 
I am the, the variable, I'm the anomaly in the heavyweight division. Uh, if I were a, a rock'em, sock'em robot, stand there and get punched in the face kind of guy, uh, this fight would really suck. Uh, but I'm not, I'm mobile, I'm elusive, I'm long, I'm quick, I'm awkward, uh, I'm not classically trained, right? So I throw things and do things that other people wouldn't do right. because I see them and that's what I want, that's what my body tells me to do. Uh, and I'm trained to be free like that. I'm a defensive player, not an offensive player, right? So like defense, you react, offense, you think. Mm -hmm. The paralysis by analysis. The more I think, the worse I do. So let my body go out there, let it see what it sees, and let it happen, man. He's great. He's been a great pro for a long time. So he can he can win at a drop of a dime. Right. Uh, I can also sleep anybody if I touch him once. So that's why everybody loves heavyweights. We don't wrestle. We don't get dudes pregnant. <laughs> we just we, we just go at it and throw hands, it. man. That's right. what it is. Right. And you mentioned uh, being a defensive fighter and. How much does that carry over from your football career? Because you were on the defensive side of the ball it in was. that respect as well. So you were reacting to yeah. what the offense was doing. Um, you know, I, I think I was a pass rusher for the Giants. Uh, and I think that the, the hip work and the flexibility of being able to get my hips turned and, and to move my feet, right? There was a saying back in football that you move your hips to the feet and motor your feet. Right, hips to the heat, motor your feet, move, mm -hmm. move, move, move them all the time. Right. Uh, so wherever there's pressure, you move to that pressure. You don't, you don't avoid it. You don't go around it. Uh, so you, you make sure that you stay mobile, flip your hips, and stay active. Uh, and if you can do that for your 15 minutes uh, plus two and a half minutes of, of wait time, <laughs> yep. then you'll be fine. Now in. Going back to your football career, I wanted to ask you a little bit because you mentioned playing with the Giants. You also mm. played your college football at Purdue, and at the same time, Drew Brees was there. Yep. So I'm just curious, are, are there any fun stories from that time with Drew and with the with the team there, at Purdue? There are, there are. Drew, uh, Drew's a great dude, man. Um, and uh, it's funny that he was the third quarterback taken in our class. There were two other quarterbacks that mm -hmm. were preferred over him. Yep. And he just kind of rounded out the class, that's it. And uh, so he and I and two other dudes were the first four people there about a week before the season started as a freshman. So Drew and I got to know each other pretty well. And uh, he'd come home with me back to Springfield, Illinois, and you know we'd ride jet skis and get crazy. But the one thing about Drew is that uh, he was so competitive that on Fridays during summer conditioning, they would have us play ultimate frisbee, right? So that way it's still it's still, it's still miserable. You're still running a ton, uh, but it's, it's a game in its way, so you don't realize you're doing as much cardio, right? Well, Breeze was, <laughs> it was such uh, a com an overly competitive person, the way he was, that he was in his Heisman campaign diving over people, trying to catch <laughs> Frisbees, you know, on the ground with right. no pads or anything else. And, and coaches were like, Dude, what are you, are you stupid? Like, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> we're trying to protect you here. Get right? out. So they wouldn't let him play Ultimate Frisbee right. anymore because he was just too competitive. Right. Like, it's just the way it is. And it's funny, like, because he, it didn't matter to him. He, he, threw a, he threw a touchdown. He said this publicly. Uh, he threw an interception. We were on the way to beat Ohio State uh, his senior year, my junior year, I redshirted. Uh, and he threw a pick to Mike Doss. And Mike Doss was running the sidelines and uh, almost scored. And Drew tackled him. And uh, Drew said that he was so mad at himself from the moment he threw the pick that when he went to go tackle Doss, all he tried to do was knock himself out. So he didn't have to live with right. the, didn't the, have to the, live with the, the pick. 20 seconds of fury, right? <laughs> and I find that amazing that, that a person of, of that level, his mentality was, I want to knock myself out hitting him because I'm so mad at myself for making that mistake. Like any team, he puts all that pressure on himself. Normally he can compartmentalize very well, but in that one moment it got a hold of him and he couldn't restrain it. And I think that's who Breeze is. Now for you, did you take anything away from that competitiveness and seeing that every day in practice? This is the quarterback. This mm -hmm. is the guy you're trying to protect. Maybe not as much at that time in yeah. football, but they were still a more protected player. Did you take anything away from that? Like, oh, this is the kind of competitiveness that it takes? Well, I, I think every you, you lead by example, right? And uh, and and you take you take note off your leader. And, and Breeze was he was our field general, and he so everybody sees that. And if you're if you're if your quarterback is that guy, it's impossible. It's like Brett Favre. It's impossible not to follow those footsteps. And if you are, you don't belong there. Um, and uh, so I think that everybody just kind of reaffirmed it. It's, it's okay to be competitive. It's all right. Like there is no uh, no participation trophies there. It's you get out there and you work and you earn it, and if you make a mistake, you own up to it and, and make it right. And that's what it always was. That whole team was cool. It was uh, a Rose Bowl year, uh, 2000. Yep. And, um, and everybody, if you ever made a mistake, it was you came back to the sideline or whatever, and it was, right, well, make up for it. You need to make it right. It was always that way. It was cool. 
Now, for you, in, in your fighting career, you've, as, I, as I said at the beginning of this, you've been in this now for coming up on 10 years, yeah. or a little bit over that. Yeah. Just as you continue to get later in your career, I'm sure you have guys coming up to you and asking you, you know, how to survive in this game. What's mm. your biggest piece of advice to them? Well, this is probably is not going to resonate very well overall, uh, but the secret to the fight game is uh, giving a punch and taking a punch. Once you know that you can give a punch and take a punch, then the, dis the, the, the secret becomes distance and timing. So I only get punched in the face for money. I don't wear big gloves. I don't, I don't go sparring. Uh, I save my brain cells for my children. Um, so I put on MMA gloves and uh, I throw for location. I throw for distance. Um, and I don't put on big gloves, not even to not hit each other, because when you put on big gloves and you're working, they're 16 ounces. MMA mm -hmm. gloves are four ounces, right? So they're much smaller, much more compact. Well, there's a lot of things in MMA gloves that slip through versus big gloves, 16 ounce gloves, that don't, that get caught. So then you find yourself punching for result versus location or placement. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it keeps getting blocked, right? If I put my shield up here and, and, and your gloves can't get through here, well, then you're gonna stop throwing said punch that would get through there. But if you put on MMA gloves and turn your thumb up, maybe it'll get through. Maybe you can throw an uppercut here or come around. Uh, and there's different angles. So learn how to fight with small gloves on and don't waste your brain in the gym. There's no reason to. You don't get paid for it. The guy you're fighting doesn't get paid for it. So save your brain. Work on distance and timing. Work on location once you know you can take a punch and give a punch. That's all that matters. Now, finally, this fight coming up Friday. Fans getting excited mm. for this bout. What can they expect? Well, Kerton's a stud. He's a beast. Uh, I'm pretty damn good at what I do, too. So um, I'm going to get out there. You're going to see my nipples. Uh, I'm going to be bouncing around and shaking around, and I'm going to punch this man in his face. That's what I get paid to do. There you go. There you go. Keep it short and simple. That's right. Bellator 215 coming up this Friday with this man, Matt Mitrione, taking on Sergey Karatanov. That fight can be seen on Paramount Network along with Days In. It's part of a doubleheader this weekend for Bellator. Bellator 215 and 216 coming up at Mohegan Sun Arena. Matt, as always, thanks, thanks for brother. the time. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next time here on The Sit Down.